Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Coming Home Network Presents. I'm Matt Swaim, Director of Outreach for the Coming Home Network. Always glad to catch up with you here. You can find us uh, online at chnetwork.org. The Coming Home Network is an apostolate full of people who came to the Catholic Church from just about every background you can imagine. Uh, We have an online community you can join if you want to have conversations with other people who are exploring these same kinds of issues. That's community.chnetwork.org. And uh, we try and make all this stuff free for anybody who wants to check it out. So to help us continue to do that, you can support us by going to chnetwork.org slash donate. All right. So it's amazing to me that these guys that I'm going to have on today haven't interacted more than they have because they've both written some of the best stuff that you can possibly find for a layperson if you want to learn about the early church. My guests today are Rod Bennett. Uh, he's got a Baptist background. Jim Papandrea has got a Methodist background. Um, both of them have told their stories on the journey home, so we won't belabor too much of the point uh, in regard to their narrative arc. You can check out their episodes in the show notes. But Rod and Jim, good to have you. Excellent. Yeah, good great. It's great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us. So I mentioned that you all are fantastic sources for lay people to earn about, learn about the early church. I was going to show my copy of Four Witnesses by Rod, <clears throat> um, or The Apostasy That Wasn't by Rod, or Four More Witnesses by Rod. I've given all these things away a couple of different times. <laughs> um, I do have in hand uh, Jim's book, which is fairly new and excellent, Reading the Church Fathers, oh. A History of the Early Church and the Development of Doctrine, and it just goes through. It's Get you one of these. But I don't have Jim's book, which is more, much more relevant to today's discussion, called From Star Wars to Superman, <laughs> where he looks at um, various myths and science fiction people and uh, relates them to faith. So there you go, gentlemen. That's the best I can do on your books today. I don't know. That's, that's good. That, that'll, that'll keep the wolf a little further away from the door for both of us, <laughs> I think. So – Today's topic um, is really fiction and the power of story and the Christian imagination, and I want to compare and contrast some of the places that we came from um, as Baptists and Methodists. I was in the Methodist milieu uh, with with how we view those those questions today. So I guess we'll start with your street cred, Rod. You've got some good street cred. Um, how did you get into what? If you could. Uh, talk about your own fascination with story and fiction and science fiction and fantasy even and how that's sort of played out in your world over the years. Uh, it started early on. Uh, I don't know exactly where it began, but it was early as I can remember. I loved anything that had a fantastic element to it. So I watched uh, the the Hanna-Barbera Johnny Quest cartoons are some of my earliest memories. They're terrific, of course, in the... Uh, uh, and goodness, I guess Lost in Space, Star Trek early on. I first Star Trek started when I was six or seven, a little too young to stay up for it. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, uh, my real lightning bolt moment of epiphany, epiphany was uh, seeing Ray Harryhausen's Seventh Voyage of Sinbad on TV one night. And that was my whole introduction to fantasy, I guess. So, uh, uh, Movies, TV started out, and then gradually I found my way to books, too. So uh, the first book that I read without any pictures in it was uh, Jules Verne's uh, During the Center of the Earth. And uh, the uh, it was off to the races after that, uh, SF and fantasy and Tolkien and C.S. Lewis eventually. And, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to put it together after that. Uh, interesting, that person, C.S. Lewis, is the nexus for a lot of people in their conversion. Lewis was, for many people, is sort of the gateway drug to Catholicism. So uh, 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 people have speculated if maybe uh, the Lord providentially uh, allowed him to keep uh, his Protestant credentials uh, because he knew that Lewis would lead people in the right, right direction, but maybe not lead them further than they were willing to go to begin with. So, uh, but I don't, I wouldn't have ever read Lewis if uh, my mother, who at the time was concerned about my soul, I was uh, away in the military and uh, like a lot of young men out on their own for the first time, I was sowing my wild oats a little bit. She wanted me back in church. So she had heard that this C.S. Lewis guy had written fairy tales and science fiction. So I got sent boxes of Narnia books and 
Paralandra and all of that kind of thing. And the two worlds came together there. You know, I was interested in religion and had had experiences in, uh, you know, church camp and all the usual kind of things and stuff. But the two things came together with C.S. Lewis. He was the first Christian who uh, could speak my language in the uh, fantasy and science fiction realm and the first fantasy and science fiction guy I knew who took Christianity seriously. So he was a, a, a bridge. So there's a lot more to it, but I won't uh, put you to sleep. Yeah. But not the first guy that you read who was into science fiction and who took the question of philosophy in general seriously. And we're going to get into some of that um, as, as, as we move on here. But how about you, Jim? I mean, how did this spark really kind of catch flame as you were a young man growing up and, and got into this genre? Yeah, I have always been a fan of science fiction. And when I was a kid, um, I discovered H.G. Wells, ironically, an atheist. Right. But right. I read uh, everything I could get my hands on by H.G. Wells. And when I read The Time Machine, I was completely hooked. Um, and of course, I was approaching it from a kid. I had no idea H.G. Wells was a was an atheist or even a sort of anti-Christian or anything. I was reading it as a kid who believed in God. And, you know, I think as I look back on it, I think the attraction to... Uh, time travel for a lot of people is the, um, the possibility of, of fixing your mistakes in the past, you know? Right. And I mean, I think we can talk about this later, but I think that's why, you know, the, the sacrament of confession reconciliation is such a beautiful thing in the church. But, um, so I, I got hooked early on to all things time travel. Um, and then TV wise came up on, you know, Star Trek, Star Trek Next Generation, all that stuff. I used to be a huge Star Trek fan. We can talk later about why I'm not so much uh, anymore, but I uh, used to be, no used to be a big star. <laughs> well, um, I mean, you know, you'll, you'll understand my reasons for that. Yeah, but, okay. um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I, of course, as a kid, you know, read the comic books and stuff like that, but I was always, I always gravitated more toward the sci-fi ish superheroes as opposed to the fantasy ish superheroes. And, and that's another issue we can talk about later if we want to, too, sort of the difference between sci-fi and fantasy. Um, but then, you know, as a young adult, I read uh, C.S. Lewis, and I read, I discovered uh, Narnia by accident, um, and I read all seven books in seven days, a book a day, couldn't stop. Pretty good. And, um, and then later discovered his, his other uh, nonfiction and then his sci-fi and he and, and Lewis remains one of my favorite authors to this day. Um, of course, I've read Tolkien, but uh, but uh, you know, I mean, everybody's either more of a Tolkien or more of a Lewis person. I'm a little bit more of a Lewis person, and uh, and so, uh, so so yeah, that that really set me up. And then you know, just being a fan of film in general, um, when I started teaching. I started using films as teaching tools and I realized very early on that those films that, that worked the best to teach Christology, you know, who is Jesus Christ were the, were the, the science fiction and the superhero films. And so that became Lots a course that I taught. Out there. Right. You know, I, I taught that course regularly and that, you know, resulted in the book from Star Wars to Superman. So science fiction for me asks the big important questions. And in spite of the fact that a lot of science fiction authors answer them from the perspective of atheists, the questions are good questions, and we have better answers, I think. So, yeah. Think about how good of questions Philip Dick was asking, right? I mean, Philip K. Dick, the questions that he's asking have suddenly become a lot more realistic and important in our yeah. <laughs> day and age, yeah. right? He's yeah. thinking... Yeah. He's thinking about, you know, sentient AI and, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Like, what if you could, like, implant false memory? I mean, this is all kinds of stuff that we're actually real life dealing with. Just to give you a little piece of my own um, credibility on this question, I'm a little bit younger than you fellas. I was born in 1979, so I'm the same age as Star Wars. So that's really where the hooks got in me. Yeah. Right. Um, and... We were in a, a world where, you know, I was not allowed for the longest time to watch. I mean, the 80s was like, a, I mean, it's a heyday of a lot of great stuff coming out, right? And in the 70s, a lot of great stuff had come out, too, through Star Trek and, and, and other things. Um, 
but we didn't have cable. We didn't have channels really hardly. Um, <laughs> I was a kid who had a library card, <laughs> right? And so I was doing a lot of this through through reading. And I probably knew more about Star Wars through uh, the um, – the novelizations and through some of the other things that were that were out there than I did from watching them. We we had the situation where somebody would tape it off a TV and you'd have to hit the fast forward button through the commercials and you know and move I'm on. Sorry. We had some shows where my parents would like stop recording on the TV broadcast if there was like a you know unsavory scene, right? And then they'd hit the record button again once we were past that. So, but I mean, huge in my in my world and you know Narnia, of course, uh, the Hobbit. I remember the. Um, the the guy who did the the um the one animated Hobbit just passed away. Um, one of the two guys. I remember that yeah, one. Rankin and Bass. Yeah. Rankin and Bass. It was, it was yeah. Bass. Uh, Bass, I, I believe, is the one who passed, passed away. away just now. Yeah. Um, but I remember just thinking, this is sort of terrifying. I'm not sure what to make of this. And then I read the <laughs> book and loved it. Um, yeah. but it was interesting as I went on um, reading all kinds of fiction, uh, in the sci-fi fantasy genre. Um, everything from War of the Worlds to more kind of modern um, stuff that was available in the in the public library, even the school school library. Uh, but when I went on to work at Family Christian Store uh, for a number of years, the Christian fiction section was was nowhere near approaching the the level of Tolkien and Lewis. Let's just say. Uh, but I I remember that. Tolkien was in there, and it was a few years before the movies would come out, the Lord of the Rings movies from Peter Jackson. But I remember, as evangelicals, we didn't know exactly what to do with Tolkien. Like, we heard that he was a Christian, right? But it was like, you know, you could point to Narnia and say, Aslan is Jesus. You couldn't do the same thing when you pointed to Middle Earth. And so there was just always kind of this discomfort there. Um, and over time, I I love Lewis and I love Tolkien and I don't know who which one I love more. I love them for completely different reasons. Uh, so that's a complicated well complicated question for it's me. It's not a competition. So I always tell right. people that's right. There's no, that's no right. need to settle the issue. <laughs> it's like uh, picking between your kids, right? Yeah. Um, so I want to go back a, a little bit to to something that you both sort of hinted at. Um, you know, one is as you, Rod, your mom seeing you you know, go off the rails a little bit and want to try and get you back on track with some Christian stuff. Uh, you know, and, and Jim, you mentioned, you know, as a Christian kid encountering stuff that you didn't even realize was atheist. Um, did you consciously, when you were picking up some of these uh, books, Rod, realize that you were getting imbued with like a philosophy or did you just think you were in appreciating a story? Uh, I knew that there was uh, ideas being uh, employed. I knew that that the uh, readers, uh, the the writers that I was experiencing, I knew that they had a point. Uh, I didn't always know what it was. Sometimes, uh, uh, and it didn't bother me so much that that it wasn't always Christian. I uh, was already enough on the outs with my. I was a weird enough kid that I knew I was never really going to fit in very well in the Baptist evangelical sort of. Uh, uh, Lifeway bookstore kind of milieu that you're talking about. So uh, I, I had already despaired of that. So the fact that I was doing something that a lot of my Christian uh, friends looked at askance, you know, I that didn't bother me too much because, like I say, that ship had already sailed. So uh, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, and it didn't scare me that they were coming from different viewpoints, really. Uh, uh, I was aware pretty early on when I started reading classic SF that. In the classic literary SF, I mean, it's very predominantly atheist. Uh, the, the the early generations, the first few generations of of science, American science fiction writers, in particular, were were schooled in atheism. They were, you know, there were a few exceptions. Uh, I love uh, uh, Cordwainer Smith. You know, Cordwainer Smith, Jim. Mm -mm. It's an English no. Anglican who who wrote. Uh, secret code for the uh, uh during i think during world war ii for the military and uh he uh was a christian writer from a high anglican perspective he wrote mainly in the 40s and 50s and uh murray leinster was a guy who a uh, classic sf writer who had been an atheist and con and converted himself to catholicism by a careful reading of the works of saint thomas aquinas so uh he uh, and he's one of the the greats. So there were a few, 
and I was glad to see that there were a few, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, uh, I may be a little atypical in this is I didn't have to kind of break free of the, Oh, you shouldn't be reading non-Christian stuff. Cause again, I, I, uh, had already made that leap. I was getting input from all sorts of places. My, my first, uh, uh, Christian, real serious Christian input was from, uh, you know, guitar playing barefoot Jesus freaks, you know, a lot of my Christian introduction to Christianity serious Christianity rather than cultural family Christianity was from, was during that Jesus movement of the, uh, of the early seventies. So I, I, my, my roots were eclectic enough that it didn't scare me that somebody came from a different direction. So when I came along, by the way, Rod, those barefoot Jesus <laughs> hippies, uh, had all become Reagan family values guys in <laughs> suburbia wearing suits and they had come up with a Christian version of everything, <laughs> right? right? So yeah, yeah. The, those options weren't on the table for me to read, uh, you know, as much. There was always the Christian version of it that was sort of, I understand, yeah. you know, available. No, no, I'm very in, aware in, of in that, my, uh, my you know, the Bible man phenomenon. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. My kids grew up watching the Bible Willie man Ames. Videos. Yeah. <laughs> Willie, if you're watching, man, send me a note. Send me a yeah. note. I sold a lot of your VHSs over the years. I bet you did. How about you, Jim? I bet you did. Uh, I mean, was this a, a question for you? Like, were you thinking like, I'm engaging ideas or were you just thinking these are cool stories? You know, I was, when I first got into it, uh, I was young enough that I was pretty naive to the idea of, you know, author agenda, right? And so, um, you know, I'm reading H.G. Wells and I'm just thinking, this is, you know, these are great stories uh, asking these what if questions about, you know, the, the limits of human invention. Like, you know, could we invent a time machine? And, you know, probably not because there's a certain sense in which, you know, only God is outside of time and all of that. And so I sort of had that in my mind. Um, for me, it was more about, I think, especially then, as, you know, I got a little older, there was an aversion to any fantasy that was too much into spells and the occult and whatever would, could be considered witchcraft. So, like, even, you know, even when Harry Potter first came out, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I, I was skeptical about that kind of thing. Like, well, wait a second, you know. Um, and so, so to me, and, you know, not, I'm not saying I was right, and just, but in my mind, science fiction was safe, uh, you know, in terms of the faith. Fantasy, not so much. So, you know. You guys were that. just better Christians than I was. <laughs> I'm not. I, I wouldn't assume that. Probably so, Rod. Probably so. Well, you bring up an interesting point, though, too, because um, this is. Gosh, there's so many ways to, to to unpack it from here, but this is, I think, part of the reason behind why Christianity, once you get into the '80s and sort of the corporatization of of Christian stuff, why when it goes to produce literature, when it goes to produce, um music it comes up with sort of safe formulas so to give you an idea that the um the christian fiction section at the family christian story that i worked at in lexington kentucky um we had a few different genres we had the end times literature end times fiction a heavy dose of that we had a little bit of the frank peretti uh which is the piercing the darkness this present you know it's kind of like spiritual warfare stuff right, right? Uh, from the perspective of like angels. Um, and then we had this whole genre of sort of like messianic Judaism fiction. There was that. But I think probably the biggest one that we had was the, uh, what we referred to as the Amish Prairie romance novel, <laughs> which is you very know, formulaic. If I remember right, and the I, man who pioneered that was there was a whole cottage industry in the late eighties, I think of taking old George MacDonald books and translating them for evangelicals. Really? The, the George MacDonald books were too difficult for, for modern Americans. Like period. Fantasties and Lilith and no, the Golden Well, not Key mainly those. His uh, uh, other books, less way out. But less yeah, his, fantastic. His, yeah. The, the kind of prairie thing you're talking about. He's, he, MacDonald wrote a lot of stories about, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the wee clergyman who uh, uh, has a small flock and he struggles and you know it's great stuff with not so much of the fan uh 
the fantastic element the fan fiction but it was uh there yeah. was there was you know you're a little too young i guess there was a real fad for for taking old 100 year old mcdonald books and and translating them into 80s uh language yeah. so old mcdonald had a <laughs> adaptation he did many, yeah, many so, there was a whole shelf a few years before your prairie so books. the prairie romance novels they were all according to a formula so it's like um esther freeman was a widow you know on the right, plains right. you know wondering if she'd ever find love again until a handsome stranger came into town but didn't care about god or right. anything except for himself would she be able to both give her his heart her him her heart and convince him to turn his art over to the Lord. Right. right. And at the end he'd get saved, they get married. You know, so. Yeah. It's a whole genre. Right. Um so with all this, I, I mean this is maybe the 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 place to do this. So I wanted to contrast maybe the the Protestant literary imagination and the Catholic literary imagination here because um there's certain things, you know, in that world, and I think really um it becomes a, a lot more apparent in like the eighties. And I think really in the early nineties, um, this, this key difference, one of the things that was elemental in my conversion was that I began to, as a Christian musician, try and uh, have more of a literary approach to, to songwriting. Right. I wanted to just come up with lyrics that were not just, you know, scripture or whatever. I wanted to go like deeper and, and get into meanings and thoughts and concepts. And, I was looking for the Christian literary tradition and I was finding people like Graham Greene and Flannery O'Connor and Walker Percy and of course J.R.R. Tolkien I'd already found and um, some others like this and and I'm finding that all the best literary minds with the exception of some like like Frederick Beekner and, and Dorothy L. Sayers but most of them are Catholic and even people like Beekner and Sayers have like this sacramental imagination and it, it was really kind of bothersome to me like why is it the only the only people who can write good stuff are the people who go to boring church <laughs> right i right. um, don't know Jesus, i wonder right? right i wonder if if maybe I, I mean you probably both have thoughts of this like what is it about um the protestant lit literary imag imagination that you think that was producing those kinds of flat um stories compared to like these catholic or anglican uh, imaginations that were producing more like sort of robust and human and imaginative stories Let's start with you, Rod. Because uh, you wrote a whole, you did a whole magazine on this kind of I, stuff back uh, in the uh, day with Wonder. I for ten years I was a speaker at uh, Cornerstone Festival, big Christian rock festival in uh, Illinois, and uh, it. Uh, in addition to the music, they had uh, these big circus tents where there would be seminars, and they'd invite invite people to come and talk on various subjects. And one of the things was the this idea of Christian. Christian interest in fantasy, Christian geeks, to put it shortly, I guess. And uh, uh, and I used to get pretty often after giving my talks and stuff, the same kind of stuff that Jim does, uh, looking for messiahs in Superman and and uh, E.T. and all this kind of thing. I used to give these kind of talks, and afterwards, very often, somebody would come up and ask just that question. Uh, I wasn't Catholic to begin with. I was, uh, I suppose, Anglo-Catholic the first year or two. But I was uh, later became Catholic. But they would come up to me and say, "Why don't why?" They would ask the exact question you're asking. Why do uh, why don't evangelicals seem capable of doing this? And why does it's they, like the, why should the devil have all the good music? It's the why should the Catholics have all the good novels? Same yeah. same question. <laughs> I guess the same problem in uh, uh, in geek terms. But uh, but yeah, the uh, uh, and I would guess and hazard, and they they, they were troubled. As you suggested that you were, you could tell they were a little upset that the people, only people who really talked sense on this issue, were uh, uh, were people that they didn't trust really on uh, in theological matters, and it bothered them. And I think the closest I've come to an answer is that uh, it may be that safety thing you were talking about in evangelicalism. So much they're so aware that. Uh, you know, that they're still a Presbyterian because it would disappoint their mom and dad if they were ever anything else. They're they're aware that they're uh uh not really deep into asking a lot of the big questions. They're looking for cultural markers that will allow them to say stay safe, you know. When I first uh became aware of G. K. Chesterton, for example, I found Chesterton in C. S. Lewis. Lewis said the 
single book that was probably most important to his conversion was Chesterton's Everlasting Man. And uh, so I went and found a copy and was absolutely shocked to find that Chester, this Chesterton character was a Roman Catholic. And it scared the devil out of me, really. It, it, uh, and still, even though I bought the book and read it, uh, I would get uncomfortable with it. And I remember taking it and hiding it for a while. If I'd been real, <laughs> if I'd been more, more wholehearted, I'd have thrown it away. But I took it and hid it in the bottom drawer, you know. So uh, I, I, the, the sense of not feeling safe is very strong in evangelicalism. That somebody's going to say something that will upset your faith. Somebody will say things that will cause you to ask uncomfortable questions that will force you to to go to a different church than Aunt Sally goes to. And uh, so all of that is that, that sense that there are bombs and hidden mines around everywhere, you know, like the, uh, the, the kind of conspiratorial mindset that everywhere there's some sort of hidden trap trying to get you. And so you might fall into it accidentally by uh, uh, by reading a book with magic in it or uh, some of this, Jim, Jim hinted, hinted at the edges of this. So I think that's it. I think uh, the writers within the Catholic circle just felt safer. The guardrails are there. You know, there's somebody to let you know when you're about to run off a cliff, you know. And uh, so you, you feel freer to explore because the, uh, uh, the road is safer, if you see what I'm saying, maybe. The evangelical feels pressured to make a gospel message out of every single book. that's that's really what 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 i think was driving a lot of these people is that you have to make a sale there has to be a teaching there has to be they're more interested in writing um aesop's fables than the odyssey yeah, <laughs> you know i mean the whole, uh, they, they uh, need uh, to, they need this to be at the end of it to be able to say well the moral of the story is yeah and also you've got to make sure that you've got a gospel an altar call by the end of the book because yeah exactly you know the reader might finish the book and step outside and get hit by a bus you know so you've got to yeah, like that handsome stranger wandering across the par- prairie and finding old Esther there. The yeah. Spencer. So you've got to get the Jim, complete job done in each and every volume, like a church service with an altar call at the end. It's a yeah. Package. Yeah. So. yeah. Jim, you had did you want to share any thoughts on that particular aspect of this? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um my experience overlaps with that to to a, a great degree. Although before I say it, I just want to say this. I loved Cornerstone. I was did you really? at, <laughs> I was at the concert where Steve Taylor jumped off the stage and broke his ankle. <laughs> a, leg- a legendary moment. I Steve Taylor, there. if you're watching this, email me, man. I have so many questions. I listen to your Squint album to this day. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I met him, ran into him uh, just like randomly when he was working on one of his early videos. I was at, I was living in California working at the... Um, at, at the company where he was doing the videotape transfer. So oh, I've actually goodness. met him. He wouldn't remember me, though. So there you have it. How many um, years but, did you go to Cornerstone? Oh, a few back in the day. It would have been probably... I went to. Uh, well, the small world it is. Yeah, yeah. You so never anyway, noticed I mean, there was a tent called the Imaginarium where geeks talked about... The, I did know that there was a tent well, called the Imaginarium. I was there every year for a good long run. I, I missed that one. There was art one. tents. There was all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But like Matt, I was, you know, I was interested in songwriting and I wanted to be, you know, a CCM musician. I wanted to make a living as a musician. And so I was going to the, I was going to the stuff on songwriting and stuff. But, you know, my, my experience is, is very similar in the sense that, you know, I already mentioned kind of that there was a fear of all things magic and witchcraft. Hmm. And so, I think so. One of the differences between perhaps the Protestant and the Catholic is the Protestant authors hedge around that more than the Catholic authors. The Catholic authors are a little more willing to go into that world. And I will tell you that it was C.S. Lewis who made it safe for me to read anything that has magic in it, right? Because in C.S. Lewis, there's this, there's this assumption that well, yeah, there's magic in this universe, but there's a God over it all, right? Which is something you don't get in a lot of fantasy. Um, in fact, I, as I've heard, this was exactly Tolkien's critique of Lewis, which was, you know, well, you're making it too obvious. You're making it too much of an obvious allegory, you know. So to your point, you know, he's, there's, there's more of a, of an, of a moral to the story. But, you know, I, I mean, sometimes even to this day, I'll watch, 
a movie or something that's that's more in the fantasy genre. And, you know, you get to that point where, you know, they explain the rules of the universe. Well, there's five stones, and if you put them all in a glove, and it's like, and I want to shout at the screen, really? Who made these rules? Who's in charge? Who's enforcing these rules, right? So it's like there's this, there are rules of the universe, but no God, right? And and so I think that, in, you know, maybe the evangelicals are a little bit more afraid to, to go into that sort of space where there's where there's magic. And so once I had read Lewis and he made it safe, then I could read Tolkien and and I could enjoy it. But I could not I, I tried reading Tolkien in high school and I couldn't enjoy it. I could only read Tolkien and enjoy it after I had read Lewis. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well I get that was my guess that fear is a lot of it. Whenever you find somebody standing in a corner and afraid to go out of it too far. They're usually afraid. Yeah, so we got into a little bit this of this in a, the Halloween episode that we did recently with a couple of fundamentalists that uh, are now Catholic who weren't allowed to celebrate Halloween and and some of the ways that they explored these these questions and and you know one of the issues with why the worlds they came from objected to Halloween and and all this was was partly because of the evil that was depicted. Right. But also it, part of their objection to Halloween was that the only way you could fight a vampire is with a, a crucifix. Right. Or a consecrated Eucharistic host. Right. <laughs> or you could cast out a demon with a priest. Right. Like there's yeah. the, the 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 weapons are all in the Catholic artillery chest. Right. So that's there's there's an element. Even, of that even too. And also, Anglo Catholic you know, sometimes the great. Uh, right. Yeah. Great and, and, and this, Van Helsing this is too. Peter Cushing, who was a very serious uh, Christian, very serious. Anglo yeah. Moff Christian. Tarkin. And uh, he uh, uh, he would go after a while. The filmmakers would allow him to just write the Christian parts of the script because he always had to go back and fix all the wrong theology that the that the uh, movie business screenwriters had written. So Cushing went in. Oh, and, that he were with us today. Fixed yeah. all the sacramental <laughs> stuff. It was great. It's great. It's a long story, but I won't tell it here. But but great. great. Ah, that's awesome. Saint Peter Cushing. Grand Moff Tarkin. Yeah, yeah. Christianizing yeah. the film industry. Yeah, yeah. A yeah, very but, saintly but, person, by all accounts. But, but the other aspect of this, too, right, is, uh, you know, a Protestant worldview, um, like the Methodist you, worldview you came from, Jim, or Rod, the, the Baptist worldview. I mean, essentially part of what we think, it, or, or what uh, what I thought in my most anti-Catholic 80s days, right, reading the chick tracks or hearing that kind of stuff come over the wire, is that Catholics are casting magic spells over water, right, or over the altar and say in hocus pocus dominocus, right? I mean, so there's this also this, this fear, fear of all that um, as well, man, I, I'm going to have to be careful because we're going to run out of time and I'm going to miss a whole bunch of stuff that I want to get to about you. So we'll just have uh, to do part two. We'll have to do part seven is what we're going <laughs> to yeah. have to do. But um, one of the reasons that I had, I wanted to get both of you on is because you both have written quite a bit about science fiction and, and faith. Um, but also because you guys are both authors who have written pretty extensively and pretty powerfully on the early church. Now, here's an interesting thing that I don't think that I noticed until I got into the early church is that I was, I think, accustomed to hear the individual Bible stories in the Old Testament as individual stories. And I think I could even, if I was pressed to, talk about the Bible as one big story. Right and find a way to do that. I'll tell you what I couldn't do. I couldn't talk about the life of the church since the Book of Acts as a story, with drama and arc and you know battles and leaders and 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 romance and all this other stuff. Jim, for you, uh, was discovering that the early church was a story. I mean, did that connect to the kind of like fascination with story that you had developed through things like science fiction and, 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 and the other, the film stuff that you, when you found that that was going on in the early church, was that part of the appeal for you? I think so. And I think in general, that's part of the appeal of history. Um, and, and again, you know, like coming back to the time travel thing, um, time travel stories really dig into this question of cause and effect, right? And, and, but that's history, right? I mean, there's no point in studying history unless you ask the questions of why did this happen? Why did A cause B and lead to C? 
And what if something else would have happened instead, right? So, um, so this, this, uh, this question of cause and effect, I find really fascinating. And so, you know, like just to throw out one example, I mean, the persecutions of the church in the third century led to really important, uh, sort of formalizations or standardizations in the sacraments of like baptism and, uh, confession. That's like super important stuff that I think people should know about. And so, you know, uh, there are all these connections, connections, connections. Yeah, Rod, you had something to add to that? No, he says it beautifully. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's some something I haven't mentioned here, but I guess it's in my other videos. Is uh, I'm as much of a history buff as I am a a geek. So, uh, but the two things cross over pretty well. They. Uh, I was about uh, to say, I don't see. I feel like you're saying the same thing in two different ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can um, be nerdy about more than but, one subject. Is what you're saying? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's why I invited y'all on here. But yeah. the, so the other aspect of this. Two, and I'm glad you brought in the third century, right, and the fourth century, because here's where we get into some really interesting stuff that connects with the question of what sci-fi and fantasy are doing. So what is the big throwdown at the Council of Nicaea? Okay, what's Jesus made out of, <laughs> right? Like, is he made out of only God? Is he made out of only man? Is he of the same substance um, as the Father, or is he of a similar substance to the Father? Of course, um, the church comes down and says, no, uh, based on what everybody's told us at this point, the best that we can say is that, no, he is of the same substance as the Father, right? And we're going to we're gonna put this down in the boldest ink we can find for all future generations to know that this is who Jesus is. Uh, why that's fascinating to me and why the history of the early church and these debates and all the councils, by the way, I mean, have to do with like who God is, who Jesus is, like what a person must do to be saved— that's what science fiction and fantasy are mostly about too. Like what's a human being? Like what, like when we come up with a guy like, uh, well, I mean, we'll, we'll take, uh, we'll take any of the Marvel, uh, cinematic universe people. Will we come up with a guy like Captain America? Like what if we could take a person who is a virtuous person and then also imbue them with like heroic, like physical traits or what if we had a person who didn't have any of those things wasn't moral but was intelligent enough to make their own suit <laughs> right um right in the case of iron man yeah, right, right. I, there's all these things are explorations even even like horror and you know those other genres right dr jekyll and mr hyde is like a question of you know what would happen if i couldn't be blamed for my my sins because it was like somebody else is doing that it wasn't really me that did those things so jim as you're writing your book which is basically about this stuff i mean how often did you see the questions that were being asked in science fiction and fantasy parallel the questions that the church is asking about who jesus are and who human beings are yeah well i think it's you know one of the biggest questions of science fiction is, you know, what's, what's wrong with humanity? What will it take to fix it? Right. And what outcome do we hope for? So in other words, what, you know, what is salvation? Right. And of course, a lot of science fiction answers that in, in a way that sort of uh, assumes that humanity will save itself through advancement and invention and all this stuff. Um, but you know, this is the question of the church. What's wrong with humanity? What do we need to fix it? And we cannot save ourselves. Therefore, we need a savior, right? And so what, what kind of a savior do we need? What kind of a savior did God send us? What does that look like? I mean, you know, the, the, the Council of Nicaea was asking the question, you know, is Jesus Christ Batman or Superman, right? I mean, is he, is he, um, or Captain America is he a, is he a human that becomes elevated to some greater status, or is he this strange visitor from another planet? <laughs> you know, like this alien, this outsider who comes down to become one of us but save us, right? It, it, or to put it in the you know terms of the early church, is he God who became a human, or is he the other way around, a human who became a god? Which is it? That's a super important question. And so, I mean, we all know how the church answered that. I mean, he's you know he's the Word who became flesh, but um. But that's, you know, that that is one of the primary questions of science fiction. What will it take to save us? I found a really astonishing. Well, last summer I was asked to speak to all the priests in the Diocese of Knoxville at their annual convocation. And I got to talk to a lot of them and I asked them, I said, you know, I've noticed an awful lot of geeky priests lately. In fact, any 
a huge percentage, apparently. And they told me, one guy said he thought it was probably close to 85%. I asked him how many priests under 50 are uh, nerdy, you know, in one way or another. And uh, he said probably 80, 80, 85%. And and I and that corresponds with what I was doing. Whenever I meet young priests, I know I'm just about a few minutes away from talking about uh, Star Trek or Star Wars or something like that. And uh, and I asked them. I said, "What do you think that is? What's the, you know, what's the connection?" And uh, the one particular young fellow that I talked to, he said right away, he said, "It's the idea of the spermatic word." <laughs> what a great answer. There's somebody who's been reading Justin the early fathers, yeah. Justin and all yeah. of that. It's yeah. the idea that there's a preparation for the gospel, that uh, God has always used myth and uh, legend and uh, fantasy and guesswork like science fiction to get people asking the right questions. And uh, so this young fellow was ready to stick his neck out and say 85% of our priests, younger priests upcoming, are uh, geeky so that's a that's a tremendous thing to know about in light of the question you're asking well but but you mentioned you know the god god has also always been planting people like saint irenaeus in the timeline too to say okay um i see what you gnostics are hungering for with your sort of big cosmic questions that are like you know unhinged from from reality and those are fun things to think about but like listen man there's the there's a real way to understand this. Right. Well, right? it goes it's been right back to St. Paul. You've got, yeah, a, right. you've got a shrine here to the unknown God. I'm here to tell it, tell you who it is that you've been ignorantly worshiping. And you could say that yeah. to people, today's young people who worship Superman or worship, uh, you know, any of the other characters. It's great. We love what you're doing. You're on the right track. But uh, I'm here to declare to you who, you who you've been ignorantly worshiping. So. It's the same job. Yeah. And that's why I don't get worried about too many of the things that are going on in, in science fiction and fantasy, too many of the questions, because I feel like at a certain point, if you're if you're creating a cinematic universe like Marvel, for example, where there is no God, at a certain point, your storytelling hits a wall, right? Your storytelling hits a wall. There's This happened in the Eternals, right? Because at the end of the Eternals, like it's... Eternals was... Far more depressing, I think, than Blade Runner, <laughs> right? On the idea of, you know, are we really sentient beings with free will or not? Um, there's there there comes a, a thing that you can't. I mean, half the world gets snapped out of existence, and you can't show a picture of people going to church uh, to mourn this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, man. I mean, there's 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 certain things that 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 you know hamper the storytelling. It's but even, gonna get really. Well, let's go back. It's gonna get really second century when people realize that. The universe that begins with with Eternals and some of the others, they're getting into this Jack Kirby uh, uh, universe that he created, which is really Gnosticism all over again. Uh, well, and uh, nihilistic too. Well, um. well, I mean, uh, you, we probably don't have time to go deeply into it, but but there's a a whole basically Jack Kirby and the others with this Eternals world that starts with the Eternals is is Gnost second century Gnosticism again. Uh, the God you see who created the earth in that is a demiurge. He's a, uh, uh, he's not the real God, but he pretends to be, you know, and it's, it's straight out of, uh, and they don't like him and they rebel against him and don't want to worship him because he's not really worth worshiping because he's not the real God. So it's the, but he's pretending to be. So anyway, that's a whole, whole other topic, but they just basically reinvented the wheel. And you mentioned Irenaeus. It's all straight out of Irenaeus. <laughs> wow, it, it it is. It was. What's funny about this too, and and Jim, I know that you've got some some thoughts on this as 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 well. Is that even when the superhero genre, uh, you know, tries to, to come up with something new, they end up kind of falling back on well, hero with a thousand faces stuff from Joseph Campbell, or yeah. in the case of, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's been written about Superman as a a modern day recreation, somewhere between Nietzsche. And the Moses story, because mm -hmm. what's happening with Superman, right? He's on this planet. There's persecution and whatever. So what do they do? They put him in a, well, they don't put him in a woven basket of, of reeds and Space float him basket. down the river. They put him in a shuttle and ship him to earth and he lands in Iowa and he's raised by people who are not his own and people aren't sure who he is. And eventually he becomes, 
you know, this figure who's not sure to do with this leadership that he's been given. I mean, there's no new stories in a lot of ways in these genres. No, that's right. And I mean, there's no doubt that when, you know, when Superman was first created for the comic books, he was more of a Moses figure than a Christ figure. It was, it was the movies, even from, you know, the, the very early movies, uh, that, that turned him into a Christ figure. And I mean, you could argue whether he's more of an Orthodox Christ figure or more of a Gnostic Christ figure, but, but, but you're exactly right. And I mean, you know, there's, there's a real trend in science fiction, um, everything from upload to, uh, um, altered carbon to these, uh, this idea that you could, that your consciousness could be uploaded into a computer or transferred to another body that is, that is very, very Gnostic and very much, um, sort of opposed to the idea that, you know, the Christian understanding of the unity between body and spirit and the Christian hope of the resurrection of the body. All, all of this, this trend in sci-fi is antithetical to, um, what we as Christians believe the human body is and the human person is in terms of a, of an integrated body and spirit and, and all of that. So, um, you know, it's easy to miss that, but there is this, there's this whole Gnostic undercurrent that, um, you know, is, is, uh, sort of dominating science fiction lately, I think. Rather than giving it out as a kind of a warning, watch out, there are people out there trying to subvert your faith. My way of looking at it is they're they're reinventing the wheel. They're reinventing every early heresy in uh, yeah. in the uh, Christian yeah, see, era. That's why I'm not too worried about this right. stuff because right. it's this stuff is oh, we've all got ammunition to to address these questions, right? right. <laughs> we've got right. centuries right. old. It, my take to, is to that these maybe topics, a little but, more innocent. Than, than this. In other words, these are people who, for whatever reason, can't hear the, the answers from the, tr- the church. Yeah. Probably aren't aware that the church even has answers on this. You're not going to hear yeah. St. Irenaeus's answer to these things at the Baptist Southern Which Baptist in church, some ways you know? to me gives us a weird advantage because once they find out that there's a, a church that has spoken to this in some way, it might create a, some sort of a nerdy interest even among atheists on, on these kind of questions. That, I hold out a, in the past. a certain hope on that. It yeah, has happened yeah. in the yeah. past. And, you know, with, with Upload in particular, um, I'm kind of optimistic. Like, I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm kind of optimistic that it might go in the right direction ultimately. Like, like it might be kind of discovering, I mean, I don't know, who knows how far ahead they write these things, but it might be kind of discovering the flaws in Gnosticism along the way, right? right? And so I'm I'm anxious to see where that will go. Of course, I'm cheering for the Luds myself, but you know, <laughs> that's me. Well, I've heard uh, there's a great Chesterton quote. Chesterton said, uh, uh, there's a great Chesterton quote for everything, of course, but he said, when I hear people alarmed that there's a modern return to paganism, he says, it doesn't worry me that much because I know that the very last thing that the ancient pagans did was to get baptized. Right. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he, he, that's Chester than not worrying about the search. Yeah, they're going to thrash around and come up with some bad stuff, but uh, uh, the search, let the search go on, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, if, if the, secular materialist world converts to paganism we've won half the battle yeah that, that <laughs> right because also saying uh, we've well, we've well, we've, we've gotten them thinking about the transcendent and something besides the power of their own ability to make stuff and solve problems but i want to uh i mean we've covered a whole bunch of stuff and again these are all questions that i don't know if people realize were were really pivotal questions in, in in pointing us to like oh maybe the Catholic Church is true right these are these are questions that were very much swirling in my mind and they were swirling in yours I mean when I was reading you know the Catholic literary minds that I was reading I was like what is it that these people are seeing about the world that makes them able to tell uh, talk about it in, in a way that makes a whole lot more sense than anybody else who's talking about this yeah. more sense than the Christian novelist more sense than what's on television what is what is working on this but um, I want to, if I can, there was something that was dropped at the beginning of this episode, and I don't know if I'm going to get you guys into a fight or what, but <laughs> I have to know. I doubt it. Uh, Jim, you mentioned you used to like Star Trek, not so much anymore, and you have strong reasons for that. I'm sure that they are not simply aesthetic. They are probably at least mildly theological, so drop it on us, man. Oh, and I just think that, um, that it, you know, the last, like, I, I tried to get into Star Trek Discovery, and I found it to be too dark, 
for my sensibilities. And I, you know, Star Trek has always had an agenda. And, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, um, interview Ron Moore, who was showrunner, um, on, uh, well, he was one of the head writers in Next Generation and stuff like that. And, and, uh, we got to talk about the early days of Star Trek. And so there's always been a bit of an agenda there. There's always been a bit of a give and take. There's, he, according to him, there's always been atheists and, you know, people more sensitive to the religious on the, you know, the, 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 in the group of writers. But it just seems to me like lately it's gone more toward, um, the, you know, an agenda that just sort of, uh, you know, it, you know, fits right in with sort of the, you know, some of the, the cultural issues we're dealing with. And, uh, so I feel like I'm just be, being hit over the head with their agenda now. And, um, you know, when, I mean, I, I won't talk about it, but, but, but the, the discovery show, I didn't get more than, I don't know, half a season into it and I just couldn't anymore. So it just got too dark and too agenda driven for me, but I will always love Star Trek. So I, from, from my perspective, Star Trek has always been watching Star Trek has been watching somebody else preach their religion, which is different than mine. Okay. But I guess the bit that ability to kind of walk a few miles in somebody else's moccasins is something that I've always not minded doing really. In other words, I can enjoy the myth, for example, in the original Star Trek, the myth of human perfectibility and that, uh, uh, that we're all going to outgrow, uh, uh, error and, uh, uh, judgment and uh, prejudice and all the rest of it. We're going to outgrow it by evolution. You know, I don't believe that myself, but I enjoy seeing it done well on the screen. You know, it's not, <laughs> I, I'm not uh, really threatened by it. It's like uh, be, it's like reading Hindu scriptures or something. It can be really interesting at times. Beautiful. You're always aware that it's somebody else telling their religion and it's not your religion, but I'm able to, I'm okay with it, even though, you know, I'm not worried that they're, you know, converting people that I should be converting. I mean, maybe they are, but, uh, but, but again, I, uh, uh, for me to appreciate any of this stuff, I have to be patient with letting people who have an incomplete version of the truth yeah. and, uh, uh, let them go ahead and be incomplete while they're telling their story, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. And, well, and there, you know, there's always that element of having to suspend reality for any, right. any fantasy story. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there's this other aspect of it now that you've brought in, you know, a spinoff of a spinoff of a spinoff. <laughs> uh, and this is certainly becoming the case in star Wars, but, uh, and, and everybody has opinions on the various trilogies and, um, I've not seen, the last thing I saw was Kenobi. I've not seen Andor or, or some of the others. Uh, but there was a very interesting thing. And this is, uh, you know, now that you've got not Jack Kirby, but people who are reading Jack Kirby doing Jack Kirby, right? right. In the right. MCU. Now that you've got Gene Roddenberry dead for a very long time at this point and people kind of working on, on his stuff is, well, th this question of fidelity to genre and fidelity to the original vision of the people who created these characters, right? And there's a there's a very interesting exchange in um, the series they did that was the making of the first season of The Mandalorian. They've got John Favreau and Dave Filoni and a few of the writers and and uh, directors around the table, and they're talking about trying to be faithful to the vision of of George Lucas. And they said something um, that I wonder how this is going to play out and if people will connect dots in some of these franchises. Uh, but Dave Filoni said. And I wish I could remember it word for word from memory. He says, you know, when you go back and you're trying to create this world that Boba Fett's in and, and the Mandalorian's in, you know, there are people who read Star Wars and who watch Star Wars and appreciate Star Wars. But if we want to know what Star Wars was actually about, we actually have the people who worked on the original sets. We know the people who created these original costumes. Uh, we know... Whatever, like, just like the Jedi passed on what it meant to be a Jedi from generation to generation, we have that within the franchise of Star Wars. So when we want to go and create the Mandalorian, we can go back and find these people or find people who knew these people. And I thought, holy cow, is is Dave Filoni explaining apostolic succession in relation to a franchise? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that's what I felt like I was hearing in that. Yeah, Joe, uh, you do 
an awful lot of questions in, exist in my mind. He doesn't talk about it. He plays his cards very close to his vest. Uh, but George Lucas, in various interviews, talks about the fact that he was raised, I think, a Methodist. He was at least taken to a Methodist church when he was young. And he had a friend who uh, who went to the Lutheran church, and he got to go to the Lutheran church uh, one Sunday, and he was amazed by how different it was. The liturgy, the inside of the building felt like a cathedral. You know, they did, they had candles and all the other things that he didn't have at home, and that he had this tremendous sense of mystery, and that uh, uh, that he really his sense of being interested in religion was born that day. And uh, it's very fascinating stuff. And then later on, you hear him telling about asking his mother question, very pretty deep religious theological questions when he was quite young. And so George has always been fascinated with and interested in religion, but I think he's been on a pretty, pretty good journey. Uh, one of the extras in uh, on the Blu-ray for the original trilogy that came out just a couple of years back uh, shows an inside meeting with Dave Filoni there and some of the other people there, the creators, where George gets a little carried away explaining the idea of uh, uh, detachment, which figures pretty pretty prominently in the prequel trilogy. And uh, he gets a little carried away and he starts preaching to the guys about detachment. And he's so, the language he's using is so Catholic, so uh, not Protestant, and yeah, it has overlap with Buddhism and all the rest of it, which he knows about too. But he himself knows that he's gotten a little carried away and started preaching and finally he stops and says, uh, and then he tells the guys around the table, all right, let us pray. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think George it, it knows a lot more about religion than he used to. And I think he's been on a pretty good journey and a lot of his religious ideas are in his movies. So the idea that there are, uh, that there's, well, not only are they doing what you're talking about, reinventing the wheel on, on the other issue, but also this whole issue of canonicity is so important. You know, everybody actually. Yeah, I mean, this is. The yeah. canon. What's part of the canon? What you is, know, who gets to say? Did this really happen or did this not really happen? Well, we check with the apostles in the apostolic tradition. And, did this happen or did this not happen? Right. Well, I don't know. Is this in Lucas's original vision? I mean, this is. And when George sold the uh, franchise, did he sell the right to canonize uh, uh, material? Or is he the only one who gets to do that by the laying on I'm of hands? You. I'm inclined to the These latter. Questions. I don't think you can sell the gift. I think that's simony. <laughs> that's, I was about to say, I feel like that was condemned pretty early in the book of Acts. Right. right. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, yeah, but lot, lot. Jim, you lot, want anything lot, you want to lot, add to that while we got a minute uh, before we shut things down here? No, I mean, I I, th I just think this is this is really fascinating. This idea of the value of tradition, which in other contexts our culture often does not value tradition, and yet here is one context in which um, it is valued. And so, um, yeah, I, I I I I tell my students sometimes that our culture has lost the ability to value things that have stood the test of time. And I want to recapture that. And this is a very interesting way in which maybe we are recapturing that, at least in you know short span of time, you know, back to the 1970s or whatever. But yeah, it's important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I can't wait to uh, go deeper with you, Jim, on time travel. It's one of my favorite subjects. Oh, oh yeah, time that. travel is you fantastic. Have to do that at some point. Yeah. We can all talk about whether it was the best decision made on the uh, set of the movie lost or the worst decision made you know, in regard to the movie. we can all have that conversation you know um but before we let you go i want to make sure that people know how to find the stuff that you've worked on if they want to read deeper rod uh you've written a number of books uh, many of them about the early church if our listeners want to find some of those where do they go well you can just google up the usual suspects you know retailers online retailers but rather than send you directly to those places uh my some of my books are from Catholic Answers Press, so you just go to catholic.com. Some of the others are from Ignatius Press, so those are both good places to get uh, get books with my name all over them. Uh, people ask me sometimes if you got a website, if you got a, a you know Facebook or whatever. I tell people I'm afraid I'm a man of the 20th century. I don't understand and know about things like that. So it's just, you're doing well to get me in front of this camera. So. 
<laughs> well, that's okay. You know, you're a man of Star Trek TOS, that's not right, Star Trek yeah, TNG. Yeah, right. uh, I like Kurt uh, more than Well, you're Star. a man of all the Star Treks, I, I actually, as we've already like discovered. Like. The only question I ever thought was hard was, do I like Kirk or do, do I, I like Picard? Kirk or yeah. do you like Picard? <laughs> yeah. Fluent in JavaScript as well as Klingon. Yeah, well, you got the reference. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Good. Thank you for helping me with that. All right. Uh, Jim, if people want to find your stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, the books that you've mentioned that are relevant to our conversation today are from uh, Sophia Institute Press. So definitely check out uh, the good folks at Sophia Institute Press. Uh, my Amazon author page is drjimsbooks.com. Um, so people can just go to drjimsbooks.com. And uh, I got my original church uh, series on YouTube and on Locals. And so uh, so I'm doing that. Yeah, and I That's think great. you take people around the world on pilgrimage and stuff too. I so do, yeah. We do the, the do the Rome pilgrimage thing as well, yeah. Very cool. Well, you can see where the, some of the stuff actually happened. And the the one book of yours I did have to, that have I've not let leave my sight right here, reading the Church Fathers, the history of the early church and the development of doctrine. And again, check out uh, Jim and Rod's Journey Home episodes. I'll have those linked in the show notes as well. Gentlemen, what a great conversation. Yeah. We got into all kinds of stuff that I did not intend to get into, and uh, we covered a lot of things that, uh, you know, I meant to, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that <laughs> we meant to cover and didn't. So, Well, let's do it again. We'll have to. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Have a great day. All right. Take care, folks. Thanks. Enjoyed it. And thank you for listening to this episode or watching uh, of CH Network Presents. Check us out online, chnetwork.org. And again, as we're heading up on the end of the year, if you want to make a gift to make sure we're able to keep on having these kind of conversations and uh, helping people who are wrestling with questions about the Catholic Church, then uh, visit chnetwork.org slash donate. I'm Matt Swaim. Thank you again. We'll talk to you again soon.